Hi, my name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. I've made a short video demonstrating the various uses of 3D gynaecology ultrasound in daily practice. Taking a 3D volume has become really quick and simple and you can either look at the images immediately or manipulate them afterwards at your convenience. The main thing is just to have a go and see what pathology suddenly reveals itself. I hope you enjoy the video. Three D transvaginal ultrasound has many routine applications in gynaecology, many of them in fertility and early pregnancy, and I'd like to show you some examples. Three D is very useful in the diagnosis of a uterine anomaly, and that's because in the standard two D uterine views, you get the longitudinal plane and the transverse plane. But when in the transverse plane you see a separation of the endometrial cavity near the fundus, you don't know whether this is an arcuate uterus or a subseptate uterus or a septate uterus. So you need to get a different plane. And that's the coronal plane. And this helps to distinguish between the different abnormalities. And in this diagram, the plane shown in purple is the coronal plane. Now, the technique of taking a 3D scan is to optimise your 2D image first. This is very important. Then you select a region of interest, you take a volume, and that's then displayed on your screen in the longitudinal plane, the transverse plane and the coronal plane. You can then manipulate these images or you can render it to get more detail. This is the rendered coronal view. Or what you can now do is draw a line on a touch screen uh, using the uterine trace feature in OmniView. There's the longitudinal view of the uterus and there is the coronal plane. Which classification system you use depends on your personal preference. There are many different ones available. This is the one that we use. And here you can see a, a normal uterine cavity, uh, an arcuate cavity. This uterus is subseptate, septate where the septum goes all the way through the cervix and possibly the vagina. Uh, this is a bicornuate uterus, a uterus didelphus, and a unicornuate uterus with or without a rudimentary horn. When you see a unicornuate uterus, you need to go looking for a rudimentary horn. And in this example, I could see a unicornuate uterus with a, a circular endometrial cavity, but on 3D I proved it to be unicornuate. And then we, I'd seen the ovary and then I saw this area off to one side with a little um, 15 millimeter lesion here. When I put the 3D on, I could clearly see that there was some endometrial cavity in this. So this was indeed a rudimentary horn, and that was much less obvious on 2D. Sometimes pregnancies are unusual, as in this case. Here you've got a pregnancy in one horn and um, an empty uh, uterine cavity on that side. And on 3D, it was instantly obvious that this is a septate uterus um, with the pregnancy in one horn there and an empty endometrial cavity on this side. That's a very different scenario to here, where the pregnancy is in this side and this bit of endometrial cavity is empty. And on a 3D view here, you can see that this is a unicornuate uterus. This is the endometrial cavity of the unicornuate uterus. Um, and this is a pregnancy in the rudimentary horn. And how important to be able to tell these two apart. In cesarean scar pregnancies, uh, the diagnosis is made on 2D, and it's where the gestation sac is deeply embedded within the cesarean niche, you can see that just there, um, or implanted on top of a cesarean section scar. And it's diagnosed by seeing an upper um, empty endometrial cavity, an empty cervical canal, and sometimes at a much earlier gestation, the gestation sac looks like teardrop shaped into the niche. Importantly, you see peripheral vascularity around the gestation sac, and this proves that it is embedded in this um, abnormal location with a negative sliding sign. Sometimes you see bulging, and it's a, an important thing to look out for, and 3D can be useful for this. Because if the pregnancy continues into the second trimester, we know that scar pregnancy is a precursor of placenta accreta spectrum. 
this is what the 3D of that case looks like and I've um, got the fundus at the top here and anterior here and what you can see is that the pregnancy is embedded low in the uterus that the endometrial cavity the upper cavity is empty um, and that the lower section is bulging a little bit and you can also see that the placenta here is embedded in the section scar and here's a very eccentric um, insertion of the umbilical cord. In interstitial pregnancy the 3D view is very important. In this case there's a transverse view of the uterus, there's the ovary and there's a pregnancy located in this position so whether it's tubal or interstitial is difficult to be certain of. But on 3D, this is the endometrial cavity to one edge, you can clearly see that this is just the beginning of the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube and that is exactly where this pregnancy is located. So important to be able to make that diagnosis. 3D is very nice for adenomyosis. So here this patient has adenomyosis in the anterior myometrium and you can see that there's the um, endometrial cavity here and here you've got these uh, islands of ectopic endometrium and areas of uh, hemorrhage into them. If, you, or if it's less clear than this, this is what a normal cavity would look like where you've got the endomyometrial junction here, this slightly hypoechoic, almost uh, transitional uh, junction. And then here, on this case we've just seen, this is the outbudding of endometrium into the myometrium. And in a slightly different plane, you can see these areas of hemorrhage. So this is focal adenomyosis. And when you see adenomyosis, you have to think, is there also endometriosis? So this is a different case. This is the endometrial cavity. And here you can see islands of endometrium in the myometrium. And on 3D, you can clearly see this outbudding of endometrium into the myometrium. So does this patient also have endometriosis? And in the video clip, you can see she has an ovarian endometrioma. She has a nodule of deep endometriosis in the bowel. And she's also got deep endometriosis in the ligaments here. And this is the video clip just showing that. So adenomyosis in the myometrium, an ovarian endometrioma, and then deep endometriosis in the bowel and in the ligaments. And that takes us on to a new entity called accessory and cavitated uterine mass, which used to be called juvenile cystic adenoma, adenomyoma. And this is a 17-year-old girl with intense dysmenorrhea. And on 2D, you can see that there's this little mass uh, over to one side of the uterus. And on 3D, it's uh, slightly indistinct, but this is a normal shaped cavity. And just slightly behind that plane, uh, you can see this little um, mass. This girl went on the mini pill and wasn't keen on surgery, as opposed to this girl who is 18, who has a slightly arcuate uterus. And again, just slightly behind the, the best plane for showing the endometrial cavity, she's got this um, cystic mass in the myometrium here um, with internal hemorrhage. And this is what that looks like at, at laparoscopy. You can see this mass here. And this patient had opted for surgery. Uh, this was removed uh, and her pain um, was cured. And this is a, a, new, a newly published paper that tells you some more detail about ACOMS for, if you're interested. Endometriosis is very nice to see on 3D. This is a 2D image of normal bowel. We're looking through the posterior fornix. And here you can see all the different bowel lesions. You see it clearly because there's a little bit of fluid in the pelvis just there. And this hyperechoic line is the serosa. The hypoechoic line with a little bit of um, hyperechoic there is the muscularis. And this is the layer that's affected by endometriosis. Here we've got submucosa and mucosa on both sides, then the muscularis again and serosa on the distal side. And bowel endometriosis affects the muscularis layer. So here you can see normal muscularis going in and going out. And all of this is hypertrophied muscularis caused by deep endometriosis. And when you look on 3D, you can see that you get a bit more detail. Also, you've got muscularis there and there. You can see some deep endometriosis in the ligaments um, and you just get a slightly different view. And it's very useful 3D to be able to manipulate this image rather than move the probe, which in some patients can be very painful. And again, on, three, on 3D, in a slightly different case, you can see here that there's stenosis of the bowel compared to just distally there, and that is caused by this deep endometriosis uh, lesion. 
in the bladder also or just deep to the bladder you get deep endometriosis and in 2D you can see that there's an area of hypoechoic tissue just there. Um, and on 3D, this was instantly recognisable. Um, this is the transverse plane now of a nodule of deep endometriosis. In this case, a lady with endometriosis, you can see here that the ureter, um, that the uh, ovary with a hemorrhagic cyst is adherent to the ureter. And when I put 3D on there, you could easily see here this little lesion of deep endometriosis with its surrounding hyperechoic fibrosis and that have caused the adhesions between the ovary and the ureter. You must always look at the kidneys when you see women with deep endometriosis because they can get silent hydronephrosis. Endometrial polyps show up very nicely on uh, ultrasound. So this is a tamoxifen related polyp. And on 3D, you can see this really nice outline of the polyp in the cavity. So sometimes when you're not sure on 2D if there's a polyp, 3D can really help you. And of course, there's different kinds of polyps. So this is more hypoechoic. This is a fibroid polyp or a submucosal um, fibroid. And this here is a small cervical polyp. So again, 3D can help you if you look. This is a case of Asherman syndrome. This lady had had a, a previous miscarriage and ERPC. And here you can see a very thin endometrium on day one with a suggestion of some myometrial adhesions. Um, and later in her cycle on day 24 with a good corpus luteum, the endometrium stayed very thin. Um, and when you put 3D on, you can see here, this is the uterine, the endometrial cavity. You can see here there are um, lots of myometrial adhesions. Coils show up beautifully on 3D ultrasound. So here is a, a copper coil in the luteal phase endometrium. This is a normal shaped cavity, so the uterine fundus is there. But this coil was harder to know where it was on 2D. You can see a bit of coil there. You can see a shadow there in 2D. In the transverse plane, you can see a little bit of, of possible coil there. But on 3D, it's instantly obvious what's happened here is that this coil, one of the arms has perforated the myometrium. This marina is in sideways. And again, here it wasn't uh, at all clear what was going on until in 3D it was obvious. There's the cavity, this is the back of the uterus, and this coil has been inserted um, through the posterior uterine wall. In this case, as you sh as saw earlier, the um, coil is in the cervix. And sometimes you see two coils in a single cavity. Well, you see unusual coils. It's hard to know what this is, transverse view. But on 3D, this is a Lippi's loop. And again, in this case, it wasn't clear what kind of a coil this was, but this is a metal circular coil, and these are harder to remove. This is an example of Assure coils, which you don't see so much now, but these are small metal inserts into the interstitial portion of the fallopian tubes, and you can check their position using 3D ultrasound. 3D is useful for us uh, follicle counting. You can measure them and count them um, using this um, Sono AVC technology. And this is what a polycystic ovary would look like on 3D ultrasound, where you can now see more than 20 little follicles giving you a diagnosis of polycystic ovary. And this is a dermoid in an ovary that is polycystic. In the characterization of adnexal masses, um, 3D is not so useful. 2D uh, gives you the answer using the IOTA classification system. Um, but I always put 3D on just to see what else I can see. And you can see that in this borderline cyst, you've got a large population here, but that almost all of the internal cyst wall is abnormal with irregularities and papillations. But in this case, it was really useful to have 3D. This was a, a cyst in a woman with pre in pregnancy. And on 3D, you can clearly see that this is a dermoid. Um, looking at the fallopian tubes, 3D is very useful again. So in this view, I've got a longitudinal view of the uterus and there was a pocket of fluid just behind. So whether that was free fluid or loculated fluid or maybe a hydrosalpinx. And taking a volume of that made it instantly obvious that it was in fact a hydrosalpinx. 
in this case too, an adnexal mass here, just lateral to the uterus. I mean, it's not clear exactly what is what in this scenario, but on 3D, again, it was hydrosalpings, and only this bit of it turned out to be ovary. The rest of it is uh, hydrosalpings. And sometimes if people have had PID afterwards, the tube becomes very fibrotic and thickened. And this is what that would look like on 3D. And when you see a hydrosalpinx, uh, you can render it in different ways. But you can also take a little video clip of it and it allows you to look inside the hydrosalpinx and confirm to yourself this is indeed um, hydrosalpinx. So in conclusion, 3D is most useful, I think, in congenital uterine anomalies, in coil location, complex early pregnancy and hydrosalpinx. Using 3D regularly teaches you to interpret the 2D image differently. It's very interesting and it has become so easy to take a nice 3D image. Thank you. Hello, I'm Connie Boats, Application Specialist for GE Women's Health Ultrasound, with our latest introduction to the Volusan portfolio, the Volusan Swift. Designed based on customer feedback, the Volusan Swift is the most streamlined Volusan in our portfolio. Let's take a closer look at some of these elements. With over a 70% reduction in hard keys and an integrated touch monitor, the Swift provides a familiar Volusan workflow with a highly customizable user interface. At only 127 pounds and a battery backup, the system is portable ready. The system provides a wide range of ergonomic positions, including touch monitor tilt, user interface rotation, and height adjustment. With the highly customizable user interface, users can adapt their Swift to their personal annotations, measurements, imaging controls, favorites, and color scheme. Onboard education videos are available in the home menu, allowing quick access to valuable training materials. Designed for efficiency, cleaning is fast and easy, enabling the user to lock the screen for disinfection of the system. This is the Volusan Swift, and this changes everything.